Hello, everyone. This is Joe Armstrong. Uh, I just opened up the lines here, top of the hour. We've got a lot of people uh, joining right now. So, you know, as usual, we're going to give them a minute or two. So hang tight. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, um, let's go ahead and get started. Again, uh, this is Joe Armstrong, and you're attending the um, August, no, July, in my months, right? The July <laughs> version of the Power System Virtual User Group. Sorry, I was looking at August somewhere on the screen here. Oh, so um, let's get kicked off. Uh, actually, I'm sitting here uh, today in the IBM development uh, site with our speaker. Um, before we get started talking about NVMe, there's a couple of announcements I have. Um, You'll see on the screen here, this is the wiki page for the Power Systems Virtual User Group. Kind of towards the bottom there, there's two events that are coming up that I wanted to tell you about. One is a uh, kind of a local event. It's local to the Chicago area. It's in Schaumburg at the IBM site in Schaumburg, Illinois. Uh, the Power Up 2018 technical event. I've attended these in the past, and uh, I know it's kind of a local, so most of you can zone out here, but if you're anywhere around the Chicago area, these are really good, these technical events that they have. It's a one-day event at the IBM site. They bring in some great speakers. So if you have a chance to go to that, um, it's a no-charge event. So uh, show up. You know, you can register the, with the links that are there. You can look at the information. You can register, and I uh, invite you to that event. The other one is probably the, the biggest um, near and dear to my heart event is the IBM Technical University. And there was one in May. This is the second one this year. It's in Hollywood, Florida. Don't get it mixed up and go to Hollywood, California. Uh, it's in October 15th through the 19th, and uh, I have a promotion code for that event. We'll give you a discount. So use the promo code. It gives you a great discount. It's a little bit better than the early bird rate even. So um, I invite you to do that. And I, I to tell you, this is, I think, the best event IBM puts on for technical people. Really great education there. So with that, um, let's go ahead and get started for um, today. Uh, we're talking about NVMe. Um, Non-Volatile Memory Express, and uh, it's a, a, a technology that's kind of coming on bigger and bigger and being uh, input, input put into more IBM systems, uh, more of the power systems. So today we have with us the uh, chief engineer for NVMe for IBM Power Systems, uh, Morali Iyer, and uh, Morali's been around quite a long time and actually over there, I have the old bio that he sent me, so I'm going to kind of shorten this up. But uh, Raleigh's worked for uh, several different companies, and I think, what, the last 10 years at IBM? 20, 22, years. 22 years at IBM. So he's been with IBM for quite some time in, in lots of different storage uh, and such activities, um, but most recently uh, doing a NVMe for power systems. And so what we're going to do today is maybe a little bit different. We're going to do an NVMe overview and just kind of learn a little bit about the technology first. So 
So um, Raleigh's going to go through that, and then we're going to kind of get into uh, the different footprints and how they are installed in IBM systems. So when we get to the systems, we're going to kind of trade off a little bit with the system stuff, and, and I'll I'll do some of that as well. But um, Raleigh's going to take us through and just teach us about the the technology. And um, you'll if you poke through the the end of this, uh, we'll see some nice uh, commands and stuff that he's offering us to, to help work with it as well. So I already did have one question about the uh, presentation materials. They're all out on the wiki there, and I am recording this, and we'll start the re well I'll put the recording out on the wiki too as as soon as I can get it all formatted and uploaded and everything. So with that, um, Raleigh, you know, you know, I kind of shortened your intro that, that you sent me, but go ahead and feel free to to say some stuff about you, and then and uh, I'll while you're you're doing that, I'll kick over so that you're the presenter. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank. Th thank you. Thank you for uh, fine introduction here. Um, yeah, like Joe was mentioning there, I've been with IBM for uh, uh, I think a little over a uh, couple of dozen years, and uh, last. I want to say about three, four years, uh, at least, my main focus is uh, MEME. I am the, what do they call, primary contact for IBM from the NVMe community. And uh, uh, I work on the power systems and trying to bring uh, as much NVMe technology as possible to uh, different power servers and as uh, new requirements and the new options we see. Um, join the uh, okay. 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 So um, I'm going to slide through. So we will, we will. Uh, I'm trying to cover in general uh, what is the technology of NVMe is, and then let's do a little bit comparison between NVMe and SAS because SAS has been around for quite a while, right? And uh, and then we will talk about. Uh, uh, what is happening uh, in IBM power systems on NVMe. Uh, so then, then from there, I think we can move forward. So, uh, so, so what is NVMe? So um, most of the folks who worked on the storage or any anyone involved in the computer, I think we all know that storage typically uh, started as a spinning disk and hard disk and uh, I don't know, the IDE interface or a SAS, SATA interface, those kind of a thing were there quite a while. And in the last probably 10, 15 years, uh, uh, one would see that I think solid state drives came in the SATA and the SAS interface as well. But you can imagine that those interfaces, SATA and SAS, were originally designed for a spinning disk, um, the rotational media, right? So there was a need uh, for a new technology to come in, uh, mainly uh, focus is the uh, semiconductor media, the NAND being one of the uh, fast uh, storage, and that was the uh, primary intention of uh, NVMe. Uh, but as the new silicons or, uh, or silicon medias are coming, NVMe is being adopted into uh, different uh, storage mediums uh, also. We will go through uh, some of them um, in the slides. So, so what is NVMe? It is a, it's a ground up design and it is the main focus is the solid state is the only uh, focus and uh, it is attached directly to the PCIe bus. There is no SAS or SATA directly attached to the PCIe bus. It is a ground up design and uh, unique to uh, system design in perspective. For example, the NVMe started uh, understanding what are the system level would do. For example, it has a queuing interface. You'll have a lot of CPUs, and within the CPU, you have threads or cores, and uh, the NVMe kept in mind to kind of create uh, multiple CPU threads or cores can simultaneously access the device. So those are the basic functionality built into the NVMe. And it, it is industry standard and there are a lot of uh, companies joined and IBM is also is one of the company. And, and uh, uh, unlike SAS and SATA devices, uh, when you say industry standard, you basically you write one time software and device drivers, you could use on multiple uh, system vendors or uh, device vendors. So uh, the investment on the 
software is paid off uh, for a longer time uh, than uh, computing technology. And it is available on multiple different form factors. We will go over that also. So it is uh, uh, the basic interface is the PCA Express, but you can imagine you can, you can make it as a look like a U.2 drive or add in card or M.2 or, or a new form factors uh, showing up uh, EDSF on the end of one. And when this started, it started to uh, focus mainly on a direct attach. When I say direct, it is directly attached to the uh, closer to the CPU and the PCIe. Uh, but since then, it evolved to attach uh, uh, via the network also. We'll, we'll cover that uh, in a slide. So I'm going to go to the next slide here. Uh, so this slide, what I'm showing here is the, what is what, what is the NVMe uh, consortium? It means who are there? So typically, it is there are 13 a promoter group. So uh, 13 companies get elected. And the period is uh, they become a promoter for two years. And then whichever the promoter uh, uh, two years is over, they can uh, stand the election for another two years or somebody else can uh, come and uh, take the spot. And then there are uh, member group. There, is, uh, uh, there are two type of members. One is uh, uh, adopter, another one is a contributor. So the difference between adopter and contributor is, adopter is like a customer. You could use the NVMe technology, you can read the spec and do, do those kind of a thing. And uh, um, contributor is something if you want to develop with the NVMe, you want to develop a device driver or a device and those kind of a thing. But uh, there are, yeah, there are three levels. The promoter groups are 13, and then there are adopters on the um, um, contributors. So the IBM joined a group, uh, I think it's a third year, uh, is I'm the focal point from IBM side. So. Uh, and just this slide, I'm showing the development timeline of the NVMe. It is actually started way back in uh, uh, late 2009 and uh, 2010 as a specification draft started. And uh, you, you can see on the slide what are the different features and how, how it is coming. So if you look at this, the top row, so what that is is the, uh, what we call a NVMe based specification. So that is what is kind of defines how you talk through the PCIe protocol and features. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the features listed there, but you can imagine there's there's a lot of uh, features are upcoming and being developed, and the whole community and the industry is uh, very active on on a huge investment there. And then bottom, if you look at it, there are two separate boxes. One is the NVMe management interface, another one is NVMe over fabrics. So NVMe management interface is mainly um, a couple of things, right? So one is if you have a, a lot of NVMe devices in the enclosure, and say you want to get the um, thermal information of the device, or you want to know VPD, whether serial number, or you want to update the micro code on a sideband. So the, the NVMe management interface specifies how you can do that while uh, device is active for a mainstream IO on the PCIe bus. So the, the way to look at it is NVMe uh, is uh, one of the sideband and also off late, uh, they have added in-band NVMe management uh, interface. So you can, along with, uh, along with the PCIe traffic, you could, you could send the uh, NVMe management command to the PCIe also. Uh, NVMe over fabrics, so that is how do you access the same device sitting on a um, far end of the hall or a different rack or a different computer or different storage system. So uh, we are not going to cover uh, uh, much about NVMe management or NVMe over fabrics, but there's a ton of information available on the uh, searching. If you go to the web browser and search for it, there's a lot of education materials available and you can learn more about it. Uh, the next slide, it is similar to the previous one, but this is kind of showing a timeline of how it evolved from the uh, each year perspective. Uh, that's a, 2011 was the first NVMe specification, 1.0 uh, came out. I think uh, typically similar to any other specifications, it takes at least a couple of years to show up the devices into the market. So if so 2011 spec is out, you can imagine like 2013, 2014, more, 
more and more vendors start building the devices based on that specification and, and start showing up. Uh, so then the uh, 2014 was the actually full featured NVMe spec uh, 1.2 was released and the, there was a uh, most of the devices today what you get it will be between 1.2 and 1.21 spec uh, even though there's a 1.3 was released uh, last year um, it will take a um, year or two to show up with all the features what uh, defined with the 1.3. Um, this 2014 is when uh, the, uh, they kicked off the war fabric specification and uh, it was um, um, a couple of years later, 2016, where first uh, 1.0 NVMe uh, war fabric specification published. And then management interface came along and there are uh, uh, another thing I want to point out, there are a lot of different work groups into the NVMe community. Say, if you are interested in a, uh, say, war, war fabric. So then there's a work group just focusing on NVMe or fabrics. And similar to that is the management interface. There's a separate work group. And there are a main uh, base uh, uh, work group called NVMe, and that they, they work with uh, the base functions of the NVMe device. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, uh, 1.3 was uh, uh, sent out, and, and uh, there were a lot of features for uh, power, power related, how do you operate with lower power, and the thermal monitoring, and uh, a lot of, lot of uh, things for mobile devices. So those are the high level features on how the NVMe evolved. So some of the highlight I'm showing on uh, this slide is the 1.3 specific. Uh, I'll, I'll take a couple of examples, so which more and more it will become more useful. Say I'm going to the middle of the screen. There's the directives, in other words, the streams. Say for example, if you want your application needs a couple of different workloads. Say one workload is a very small number of ops, say write only ops, so small write ops for logging purposes. So you can you can create a stream. You can let the device know that hey. This particular stream I'm creating, but I'm please expect only the workload of a smaller rights so that device knows that hey, uh, this is the stream I need to handle it um, uh, with the rights and the smaller rights so they can uh, have a better flash management inside. So another another stream you can have some large read ops or something like you want to stream to the movies or something. So you give that and it knows that yeah that's a very kind of a slow process and doesn't need to give a lot of uh, priority to service the stream and uh, it could provide that. So those are the, one of the examples, the streams could help in the combination with the application onto the device. You can uh, uh, achieve the maximum performance. While doing that, you can extend the longevity of endurance of the device so that you are letting the device know what features are there and then so device and applications working together. Right, um, and then there are virtualization enhancements. If somebody uh, wants a SRIOV kind of a thing, and those features are being added, it's already added as a part of 1.3. And also, you can see that another host control thermal management. So that is, if you if you deploy in a large uh, number of devices in a single rack, and uh, if you have uh, a room temperature rising or something, or device uh, is going beyond expected range of operation host can control what how to how to let the device know uh, so you can either uh, tell the device say after this temperature you can start uh, throttling or you can let the device itself know that yeah you have a uh, it's called a autonomous thermal management you can give complete complete control over to the device uh, at the cost of some performance right so they can manage the thermal uh, of the device uh, themselves uh, there are a lot of other features like a sanitize. So you, if I think more and more security issues are coming up. So if you want to completely wipe out the device uh, with the encryption kind of a thing, you can do that. Sanitize the device before you hand it off to somebody else or you want to or trash the device. Uh, uh, before doing that, you can use the sanitize feature. So those are just a few examples I've uh, mentioned there. Um, next, we are going to jump into the completely different uh, topic here. This is I think Joe also mentioned the different form factors, right? So uh, you can think about there are uh, three main form factors are available in the NVMe. So the top one, if you see that's a add-in card, uh, you probably are familiar with the, any standard uh, 
uh, cards which goes into the computer, right? So one is the half height, half length, and the other one is the full height, half length. So typically half height, half length is uh, uh, power limitation is 25 watts and the full height can go uh, over, over 25 watts. And the interface on these are normally uh, by eight interface. So when the NVMe started, uh, all the devices will be at least PCIe Gen 3 capable. So if they are using uh, eight lanes of a PCIe Gen 3, you can imagine the like, raw bandwidth of the device would be up to eight gigabytes per second. Uh, when you go to the PCIe Gen 4, which is uh, the, all the IBM Power 9 systems support PCIe Gen 4 uh, since we introduced end of last year our first Power 9 server. So with those device, with those servers, of our Gen 4 servers, the bandwidth doubles. So half height, half length interface card would handle up to 16 gigabytes per second. It doesn't mean that devices would deliver that, but there's a system capability to, to do that. So that's the class of devices, the add-in card, that is always going to be the highest performing uh, device uh, into the system. Uh, if you imagine. The main reason is the power and the, uh, what you get, the number of lanes to the uh, device is a by eight. So the next category is a two and a half inch, and, and so it's called a U.2. It looks like a similar, to exactly like the same thing, like you're you are familiar with the SAS drives. Uh, and if you are familiar with the SATA drives, uh, that uh, also, it looks like the same, but um, two and a half inches is the, uh, the width of the device. It comes into two, two thicknesses. One is the seven mm, another one is the 15 mm. The typical SAS drives, uh, spinners, or uh, SSDs, those are 15 mm, and um, the, uh, the R of the thickness is uh, 7 mm. So uh, both, you, you would see in the marketplace, both uh, 7 mm, 15 mm are available. Uh, the One of the difference would be the 7 mm, uh, you have a lower wattage, your wattage of the power consumption will be between 10 and 12 watts at the max and uh, uh, 15 mm would be go up to uh, 25 watts where you'll have the highest performance. Uh, but both 7 mm and 15 mm, you will get uh, up to four PCIe uh, lanes. It could be Gen 3 or Gen 4, depending upon uh, which device you pick and which system you want to uh, hook up to. And uh, uh, U.2 uh, allows, it's got a much better RAS capability in the sense it is typically in the front of the system, Unlike the add-in card, you have to kind of open the top cover or, uh, or in IBM power systems, we do allow hot plug management of uh, uh, add-in cards. But in, in general, storage folks would prefer um, U.2 drives, but look like a drive, it is typically in the typically in the front of the system and you can kind of blink the LEDs or a fault, if you find a fault of the drive, you can blink and then uh, change the drive. So RAS capability wise, um, U.2 is much more preferred. Between U.2, 7mm and 15mm, the performance is going to differ. The main reason is uh, power and, uh, uh, and, and the market segment, what is targeted also different. So two and a half inches targeted for data center and the uh, load source and the uh, smaller workload kind of a thing. And the 15mm is the enterprise class and high performing devices. In the third category, um, started as a M.2, if you guys have seen uh, M.2 stick uh, in a SATA, uh, it's, it's a really a old uh, interface. So the NVMe uh, uh, does support M.2 interface. Predominantly, even though M.2 has got four or five different sizes, 22 by 80 and 22 mm by 110 mm is the most popular uh, form factors in the M.2. And, and it is much lower uh, power compared to other form factors. Uh, the target market for M.2 is, uh, it is targeting towards uh, SATA replacement. So if you are, if you are having uh, your uh, laptops or uh, entry level uh, desktops or your MacBooks, most of the recent uh, laptops, you, you could find that M.2 uh, NVMe as your load source device. So now there's a new form factor, derivative of those are coming up and uh, uh, the M.3, it, it is similar to M.2, but the uh, uh, bit instead of 22 mm is a 31 mm. I think that uh, spec is being redefined. And if you, if you ask today, I think 
industry would call nf1 that's a, it's called a new form factor one and also there is a another form factor called edsff you can see in the bottom right also sometimes referred as a ruler so it's like up to up to one foot long and uh, uh, the 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 connector is defined to be ready uh, for uh, gen 3 gen 4 or pcie gen 5 speeds so uh, there's only one vendor currently uh, developing that and the systems are yet to show up with uh, that form factor but uh, that's another uh, fast growing form factor in the industry so there are you can you can imagine really like eight or eight or ten different uh, sizes and uh, shapes you can get the nvme but the base fundamental thing is it is connected directly to the pcie bus so that's the uh, that's the fundamental thing on the nvme uh, next i'm switching to uh, very very high level introduction of nvme over fabrics so anyone uh, worked on uh, uh, sand kind of solutions you can you can see that so you are you are accessing your storage sitting in a, uh, another uh, another rack or another uh, server kind of a, uh, model so your uh, traffic you are sending uh, from an initiator that's being your server to a target device which is going to be a some kind of an enclosure uh, so nvme or fabric specification came so they basically the goal for one of the biggest and important goal for the NVMe or fabric is uh, want to keep the similar performance level. We go, to the, go over the performance in a few slides down the line. But uh, if you are accessing the device locally uh, or remotely, the remote access should not be uh, no more than 10 microseconds additional overhead. Uh, we, we have seen in the labs uh, the order of uh, uh, five or six microseconds within additional order of within five or six microseconds we are able to access the data from a remote server and uh, nv more fabric is not favoring any particular fabric so you can use your fiber channel or if you have infinity band infrastructure or if you have a rdma over converge ethernet uh, or iwar and more recently uh, there is a TCP, NVMe or TCP. So if you're existing a 110 gigabit uh, Ethernet, if you have, and then if you, you can still uh, uh, will be able to access the devices on the remote side as a target device. Uh, it, it basically assumes that very basic uh, functions of uh, RDMA capable devices, so most of the RDMA capable devices would support discovering the device and send receive message and the read or write for a larger packet. Send and receive message typically handles the packet size of probably 4K or less. Uh, but NVMe over, NVMe over TCP, uh, as we very familiar with the TCP interface, it will work on existing uh, uh, TCP networks. Um, now, so this, this is the chart. I think some of them told that they like this chart, but uh, uh, so this chart, the way I put it is from a top to bottom, what is the closest to the processor and what is which one is the further away from the processor. As you can see that, um, of course, the one thing is not shown here is within the processor, you have a cache L1, L2, L3, and I think we have L4 cache in Power9 um, processors. Uh, but after the process of the closest, uh, fastest, what you can get is a DRAM. And then uh, uh, DRAM, as we know, it's not a persistent. It's so as long as the power is there, you have the data. And then the new memory type, uh, storage class memory. So that one is coming along. I think uh, we already see some devices based on storage class memory. And that the difference between uh, DRAM and storage class memory is uh, one is a persistent, another one is not. Uh, so th those, the top memory interface are byte accessible. So you are basically accessing as a uh, memory kind of interface. So the next class uh, is the media is same, like a storage class memory, but you are attaching through the PCIe and VME. So your latency is higher than what is what you would get out of, of typical memory interface, but it is um, much, much better than uh, other medias and other other way to connect the uh, storage. So then um, there is a low latency 
flash. So this is kind of sitting in between standard uh, flash and the low latency flash. You can see the numbers on the screen. And, and there's a mainstream uh, NAND flash based NVMe devices, which is typically 90 microseconds or less for a random 4K read access and also 25 microseconds or less for a, a random write access. And a single device would be able to deliver um, three quarter million uh, IF, that's like 750K, and the write also is a pretty good on the bandwidth if you can imagine, see that it's a, uh, between three and a three and a half gigabytes per second bandwidth can deliver. So all the way you can see the bottom most, uh, the slowest device in the storage class you can see is the tape, right? Uh, a tape is anything you access uh, is going to take uh, seconds. So just above that is our standard uh, HDD and, and it is in the order of milliseconds. So now, I always get this question. So yeah, it is a uh, NVMe looks like it's a fantastic technology and uh, is that all of the technology going to go away? The, the answer is no. IBM still sells a lot of tape. We like, uh, there's a market for everything. And uh, uh, there is some displacement would happen on, on, on the, based on the application. One storage uh, would be preferred versus other, but uh, all the storage uh, defined here is going to stay for a long time. Uh, but within that segment, I think the market share might uh, shift a little bit here and there, but it is all expected to stay there. So I just want to uh, let, let them know. So, so, so this chart is actually from Gartner, not not from me. Um, there is, a, you can see from a 2016 to 2021, there is a adoption of a NAND based. So this particular one is nothing specific to NVMe. So this is trying to tell that uh, uh, the high end hard disk drives are slowly uh, going away and uh, this, uh, the entry level SSDs are taking the spot of the high end, uh, high end spinning disk. So uh, the 15K RPM, what IBM used to offer on the vendors, I think uh, there are no more development happening on a 15K RPM. There are most of the device vendors uh, have already stopped or they are in the process of uh, uh, stopping manufacturing 15K drives and uh, looks like 10K RPM drives also following similar trend uh, in in few years, but 7.2K RPM and 5600 RPM used in the laptops and other things uh, uh, that is going to stay for a really, really long time. So it's not going to go away because cost per gigabyte of those devices uh, are are really going to be compelling reason to keep those devices on for many more years to come. Uh, so now this chart is very specific to NVMe um, because of the new technology and there was a, a premium was charged by the vendors uh, because of the huge investment. And you can see there are three class of dev uh, devices defined. One is a PC attached. So that is your laptop, uh, MacBooks, or entry level servers of x86 and those kind of things. And then the server based. Right, you have a um, uh, high-end servers, mid, IBM offers all range of servers, and there's a server, and then there's a storage itself, storage, um, it's like a SAN solution. Um, it, is, it is actually easier to do uh, for, a, for a PC market, it's always very early adopters. Right? They, they uh, adopt the technologies pretty quick, and uh, a server takes longer the storage takes even longer to adopt the new technology because of the investment needed and the, the whole infrastructure needs to change. But it is coming along pretty well. And uh, as of uh, this year uh, for the uh, adoption rate and also the cost of uh, PC and the server market, it is, um, uh, the premium is gone. And we expect uh, by next year, uh, premium uh, charged for the uh, NVMe SSDs into the server class also will be uh, gone, so it will be equal to any comparable SaaS devices. Okay, I think that's a very high level uh, of the 
technology overview and uh, i think we have a couple of charts on comparing nvme up to sas so this particular chart is trying to show that uh, uh, what are the different features when we look at within the storage medium so i, I just just took a standard enterprise class sas ssd and also comparing with the nvme uh, as you can see most of the features are available on both so it is not that uh, uh, one is uh, greater uh, compared to other in terms of uh, ras features right so um, first thing comes up what happens to the data integrity so both sas and nvme supports and the nvme supports uh, what is it called a uh, data integrity extension uh, along with the uh, data integrity field i think industry typically we refer that as a t10 uh, both are supported uh, the, the one of the let's say the lacking feature on nvme but it, i think it will take probably year or two there is no hardware rate uh, adapter available so typically we are familiar with the sas adapter uh, what most of the vendors offer as a hardware rate uh, that is still not available so but what you can do in the data center they don't use the hardware rate right? they use the uh, eraser coding basically they write their own uh, rate algorithms and use it so on and also operating systems like linux supports uh, software rate of uh, all all type of rates 0 1 5 6 uh, whatever you can think of but the performance is not going to be as good as hardware rate right? so that's uh, uh, that's one uh, one lacking feature but industry is working on it um, and then one one thing is actually personally I like is the smart attribute. So as a single interface, you can get to know about the device, uh, most of the functions of the device, how long the device was powered on, how many how many times we power cycle, how many times, uh, how how much we use the device, possibly use like like in the car, you can you can you can think about is your fuel cage, right? So so the all the fuel cage is kind of embedded into the smart attribute. So uh, that's that's one one good thing about the MVME. Um, the features like surprise add remove, so those are, those are supported as well. So you can uh, add the uh, device at your will and then remove it while, while the entire enclosure is up and running. So I'll go to the next one. So this is the, this chart is trying to show that very, very high level comparison on the performance between SAS, SATA, and NVMe. On the top side, it is trying to compare SATA drive. So the SATA drive with the, uh, if you remember, I was mentioning the U.2 7mm thickness, that's the half the thickness of a standard drive. Uh, the market is, uh, so that particular device are targeted as a SATA replacement in the marketplace. So as you can see, uh, both IOPS and also the gigabytes for the read and write. Um, yeah, SAS, sorry, uh, SATA uh, is very much limited by the interface speed. Um, SATA does not go beyond three, three gigabytes, whereas NVMe, even the Gen 3 device, uh, each lane is uh, eight, uh, gigabits and then uh, you can imagine the four lanes of uh, thing you get uh, um, very very high very high uh, bandwidth so up to four gigabytes possible in the single device and if you go from a gen 3 to gen 4 you can you can double the bandwidth on the bottom I'm trying to compare with the uh, SAS SSD with the two different form factors of NVMe. Uh, one is the U.215 mm that look like exactly look like a SAS SSD. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see the performance jump between a SAS SSD to NVMe U.2. And then I'm comparing the NVMe add-in card. If, if you remember, I was mentioning add-in card has more PCIe lanes to, to talk to the device. 
So that is the pump you are getting in the performance uh, when you are measuring the, between uh, even the U dot to NVMe to the add-in card. So, so three steps performance improvement. So, so SAS is a baseline, and then if you go to the U dot two, you get a little bit more performance, and you go to the add-in card, you get a, a most performance out of the NVMe device. Okay, let's. Uh, I think uh, now uh, we'll we'll talk about closer to what we are doing in a power systems. So that is the next few slides. We'll uh, talk about power systems. I think uh, Joe, you want to yeah, you want I'll, to take over? Uh, oh, maybe both I'll, there. Yeah. You you can go so, ahead. Okay, and... I'll I'll talk about this chart and then yeah. I'm following. Uh, so there are some. If you remember, I think the uh, few charts before I was uh, showing about different form factors, and uh, this particular chart is trying to put a code names as internal code name on where we are trying to use what device. Uh, IBM introduced. Uh, internal code name is called Leaf. Uh, that's a PCIe Gen 3 by 4 add-in card in uh, 2016. So that's the first time we introduced uh, the NVMe device. And the last year uh, we introduced a Gen 3 by 8 called a Bolt adapter. The, the main difference is the first generation is Gen 3 by 4, and the second generation is Gen 3 by 8. Performance uh, uh, is quite a bit uh, improvement. And then in the middle. Uh, we have not, I think we are in the process of announcing, but if, if customers cannot buy any uh, systems with that device. The internal code name is a Poseidon that's uh, supported in a P9 scale up servers. It's like, I don't know what the model yeah, number yeah. So We'll show a little bit about more of that later. Yep. And then the, the last uh, but not least is the, what the internal code name is a Spark that's a P9 for scale out system. And both uh, uh, Spark and the Poseidon, both our initial expectation is we use those devices as a load source for the internal system, not really a lot of storage, but customers could use it for either. Right. So we have some uh, feature codes, kind of thing, and some of the other for some of the ones that are out there, um, like Spark, for example, we'll see feature codes in some of the later charts here. So this is you know, I really don't want to talk to this chart a whole lot. This is really feature codes for the different backplanes, and I think that our next chart really shows the Power 9 ones a little bit better. But this is, you know, we have various backplanes that we offer in our systems. The top group is uh, the Power 8 systems, and the bottom group is our Power 9 scale out, which uh, we talked about earlier this year when they first came out. And so if we uh, go down to the next chart here, we'll see the um, S924, H 924 scale out system and then uh, the little table there is the different backplanes that you can get with it. The top one there, the EC59, what we call a feature code when you order that, um, is the NVMe cards, all right, so that you get with the uh, M2 connectors. So you buy one card and you get two connectors, kind of if you look at the picture on the bottom right, the card with the, the two uh, uh, actually M2 devices on it and each of those M2 devices is a 400 gigabit or gigabyte um, device. Uh, so that's really where the device is at. And we'll, we'll show um, here where they fall into the, the actual system. The other key thing on this chart though, is that the table that's in the uh, the left hand or the right hand side um, kind of shows you what the different, uh, you know, devices, storage devices you can put in that in these systems are. And uh, one thing you want to look at uh, when you look at this table for the uh, SSDs and for the NVMe is the drive right per day. So the drive right per day is how much data can be written to the drive before you know you start using up those cells. And uh, a, a drive right per day, uh, just to refresh everybody, is you can write the total capacity of that drive on that drive every day, once a day, for the lifetime of that drive. And I think our warranty on these NVMe devices is uh, three years or five years? Uh, so as a device itself, it's typically five years. But our warranty goes per system. So if the system warranty supports, so it's three years. Yeah. So the NVMe devices are three years on that. So I, and here it's listed as 1.5 drive rights per day um, on the top of there. But you can see when you order the other SSDs as well. You know some SSDs are 10 drive rights per day and some are one drive right per day. Just be clear when you're ordering these things or you know you're configuring your system or what you want. If you're going to be doing lots of reads or lots of writes to the system, you want a 10 drive right per day system or 10 drive right per day um, device, okay? 
<clears throat> so this is the actual picture of the uh, S924, H924, and you can see here where it says the two internal storage slots. Actually, I think I can use my device. So here's where those NVMe um, cards plug into. Um, if, if you're not plugging SAS, so this is also where the SAS cards plug into um, that drive, you know, Oh, that work the drives on the front of the system. So you get your choice, you either have SAS drives or NVMe. Now you can put one of each. So you can plug in a SAS card and, and use all the SAS drives and you can have an NVMe card here if you want. Um, you know, just think about what your uses are and everything and, and if that's what you want to do. Uh, you can do two SAS cards and, and split the, the um, back plane here and I'll show a picture of that. Um, or you can do two NVMe. If you do two NVMe, you can mirror them to each other as well. So just, you know, this is this is where they fit in. And this is a, a picture of really the adapter uh, of that goes in there. And again, I don't really need to talk about this um, very much. This is the SAS adapters that plug into the C49, C50 slots. And that, those are those, those two slots. These are those two slots here, C49 and C50. So um, we'll just go on here. I kind of we'll put in this chart just to show you if you split that backplane, how it really works. So if you have one SAS card in there, and, and this doesn't really apply to NVMe because you know we're talking about how it connects to the backplane. But um, if you if you plug in one um, card, then it uses both sides of the backplane and one SAS adapter for all the drives, right? If you plug in two SAS adapters, then you can split your backplane. Very common split the backplane and, and BIO on each side or boot drives on each side and, and you have, you know, redundancy here. Um, if you use a high function card, it's a little bit different, all right? Or if you have um, a, another, the other storage controller cards, it's a little bit different. So just, you know, just to show you how it splits up and, and what your different options are. This is really, you know, probably more information than most people need to know, but I think it's helpful just as you visualize how you're configuring this, how you're laying out your LPARs and assigning devices, you know, maybe this helps you visualize a little bit about how all this works in the background. Um, I put this in here really because I, it shows the, the card and it, how it flips up and these M2 devices slide in. This is actual picture of, of the card here and here's the M2 device and another M2 device here. This is a picture of just the M2 device. You can see the connectors on the back there that slide in and, and connect in on the card here. So it's just a little bit of uh, information there. Um, the feature codes up here for, for what you're getting, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the cards and the carriers and stuff, just if you need to know feature codes, um, just some information there on that slide. And this um, kind of put in here because when, when the first cards came out, you know, when we first came out with Power9 and, and here's two adapter cards, right, with four drives on them. And, and we're told each drive is actually, we kind of had to dig a little bit, but found out each drive is independently assignable. But hold it, they're on a single adapter card. You can't do that with a PCIe card. How does that work on these devices? And there was a little skepticism um, going on here. So um, good friend and colleague, uh, smart guy, Bob Schuster, uh, rounded up some, stuck them in a system, uh, and we went and looked. And golly, sure enough, they are independently assignable. How does that work? And it's exactly because of how Morale described these are by four devices and the the, car, the the carrier is a by eight. So really it splits those eight into two. So you really do, um, you know, assign each device independently. And when you, when you look at them, um, and this is a screenshot from HMC, when you look at them, you see, you know, four distinct devices that are independently assignable and mirror them any way you want. Certainly you probably want to mirror them to the other carrier um, if you're going to mirror them like that, but um, just to kind of show you how it looks there. Oh, yeah, a little line around them. All right, and then one of the other things that brought up is, well, if I use NVMe, is it cheaper uh, or is it more expensive uh, or what? So here's um, a little side-by-side -side comparison. If you configured a system with some drives in it, some SSD drives and SAS cards um, on the on the right, and on the left is if you configure it without drives, SAS cards, but you put in two NVMe devices. And it's actually a little bit cheaper that way. So here you um, see your NVMe devices here and, and the cost there. And over here you've got a bigger cost for um, your SSDs and everything. So just to let you know, it, it can be cheaper. Now, um, I have to qualify this with NVMe devices in here are not concurrently maintainable. You know, if your SSD 
um, goes out on you, then you can pop that out and put a new one in. Uh, the SAS card you can't, but the SSD you could. With the NVMe device, if the NVMe has some kind of a failure, uh, whatever it is, uh, it's not concurrently maintainable, so you have to power down the system, um, you know, open it up and take it out. So just, uh, yeah, just, just to add, so that's why we strongly recommend uh, mirroring. So one device failure doesn't bring your system down, and uh, it's always always mirror it, and so you can continue, and then you can do the deferred maintenance uh, when you have uh, time. Right. So we recommend the mirroring. We also recommend it's really just a boot drive because it is 1.5 drive writes per day. Right. It's not a data drive out there that you're going to be writing to a lot, right? So right. We, we really, and we're thinking of other things that you could use this use this for, like maybe NIM server type thing where you're loading images on it and, and pushing those off. Maybe if you're doing cloud and you've got images, uh, golden images that you're going to deploy, you could put those on it. Um, but it's not really a data drive that you're going to be, you want to be writing to a lot. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, so Morali, I'll let you talk about this yeah. one. Then. So this is just a continuation of that uh, previous chart. So it is trying to compare in terms of performance. I think uh, uh, if, you, if you take uh, NVMe M.2s tools and compare with uh, spinning disk, I think uh, uh, the cost wise, that is what uh, uh, we also compared. I'm not sure the previous slide compared with the SSD or HDD, but uh, uh, if you compare SAS HDD with the controllers on the Spark device, uh, the performance wise, you can see that uh, uh, the NVMe for the read and the write, uh, it is it is uh, well well within uh, 100 microseconds. Uh, but the same thing if you compare for a SAS HDD, that's in the order of uh, milliseconds. So this is trying to show you uh, in terms of what kind of performance uh, you will get. So the then. So if you uh, if you download the charts, you won't see some charts in your downloadable deck. Um, this is one that this is. Uh, We'll preview for you all to join this webinar. Soon to be announced system. Uh, this will be our four socket power nine. Now, uh, you'll notice on the bottom here where it says Poseidon, Morelli talked about the different form factors. And this is the Poseidon form factor uh, that will show up in uh, our upcoming um, enterprise systems. All right, so a couple of things. Um, one, this is front view. Morelli talked about you know, most of them plugging into the front, concurrently maintainable. So you'll see that uh, we have some NVMe devices that are concurrently maintainable coming out uh, in the future in our enterprise systems. Uh, so that's the uh, four socket Power9 one. This is the modular one. Gosh, I hope you all can visualize these and what they might be like. But uh, so this is the modular, uh, our Power9 system, uh, the other scale up uh, enterprise system that's soon to come out, um, replacing the um, 880 type, uh, 870 mm -hmm. type systems. This they pl actually plug into the back of the system, all right. So uh, it's still the same thing. It's the same form factor that is in the uh, just the single node four socket. Um, the same form factor, but it plugs into the back. Again, there's four of them that are going to be plugging into each node of the system on this uh, scale up system. So a little preview for you all there. So just w one one other thing I want to tie back with this class of devices, what we talked about. Poseidon into the, the four socket system on this modular enterprise system. Uh, both the system uses uh, what we call a NVMe management interface also. If, if, if you recall, I was telling for a, a thermal management, you could use sideband signal. It is not in the in-band, not the PCIe. Um, it is a SM bus, I2C bus interface. So these both system constantly monitors temperature right from these devices. And for whatever the reason, if the system cooling gone bad because of the fan issues or something else heating up, the device typically will heat up. So they will take the input of those thermal information, plug it into the cooling management of the system, and then uh, increase the fan speed if needed, or, or manage it active. So what we call a active thermal management from the NVMe devices. So both these system implemented. Not this is not same thing is not implemented on the first Spark device. We call a uh, scale out system. 
So those are really uh, boot kind of devices. These are, uh, I wouldn't call still a full-fledged uh, NVMe capability device because if, if you remember, this is the U.27 mm devices. It doesn't have uh, the same performance of the uh, standard 15 mm uh, U.2 devices. What's the drive rate per day on this? So this one, um, I want to say it's like a 2.5 to 3 drive rates per day, but we do offer three different capacities, 800, 1.6, and a 3.2. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I believe on the fleet, on the fleetwood of this smart this system, we do offer only 800 yeah. to even start yeah. with. Right. Uh, the one of the main main difference why we introduce this is prior generation. If you want to boot the mic operating system, you need to have an external storage. Yes. But in this system, uh, customer could order with the internal load source. So you don't need to uh, have any externally attached uh, SAS or, or in storage. Right. So if you all know the, the Power 8 systems and the 870 and the 880 have no drives in, uh, in the nodes, or the KEX as we call them, um, they have no, no drives in them. So if you want to have uh, internal storage so to speak you have to you have to connect a uh, you know something besides sand uh, or network you, you have to connect a uh, storage drawer and you have drives in that so uh, a little bit you know yeah uh, for those types for those enterprise class systems usually got sand out there and everything anyway so not that big a deal but a lot of people wanted this internal storage via iOS and and such and that so anyway uh, in this particular system that's up here now in this modular system, this is the internal storage. There's not other drives. These other things that you're seeing down there, those aren't drives in the system. This is the only storage that's in the system uh, is these NVMe drives. Yeah. Okay. So if we go up here, you'll see in this other one in the uh, more the 850 replacement, um, the 850 replacement, you'll see that there are other drives in that system as well um, on the bottom there. On, on the bottom and, and, and on, on the top. top. Yeah. So there are other drives in the system, just like there were in the Power 8, 850. So um, just to let you know that that's kind of some some keys to this um, new internal storage in our in our scale up system there, which would be pretty nice. Uh, let's see. Did you talk about that already, right? So uh, no, I, no, I think no, no, I, no, no, no. Okay. So this one is so similar to the chart what you are compared uh, on a scale out system using a M.2 modules. So this is the U.27 mm what we are uh, going to use on a four socket and the uh, scale up servers. So the performance of the, this device is in the NVMe is better than uh, what you have in the M.2. But again, if you compare with the uh, slide on the beginning where I compared with all type of uh, different media, so still this this device won't be uh, comparable to add-in card or a 15mm uh, U.2 device. Um, but uh, as you can see, but this is the performance of a single device is uh, uh, so far better than any of the competing uh, uh, SAS, uh, SSD, or uh, HVD devices what we offer. So uh, there's, a, there's a good performance reason uh, if, if any applications are requiring low latency. Like I said, I think not, not all applications need it. Uh, uh, we still offer our tape drives uh, for particular applications. So if, if you really need, uh, want to boot the system faster or you want to have a faster storage, uh, you could consider NVMe as uh, one of the options. So, and uh, it's upcoming new technology, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of industry investment is happening to bring this uh, uh, technology uh, with the more features. So, okay, so that about that, and then yeah, so so this one probably uh, most of you guys heard of the Department of Energy. We we just uh, it started last year. It's a, it's a coral is a collaboration of a three national labs, Oak Ridge and Argo and Livermore. So, IBM uh, delivering uh, two of the three labs. So, actually, the way the contract is, no single vendor can have all the three. 
Right. Uh, three deliveries. So we won. We won two of them. We won two of them, and uh, uh, this is the very very high level where the NVMe is used in the system. So this is uh, uh, 200 petaflop is a total computing power using uh, over 5,000 plus compute nodes, and those are uh, power nine. And if you look at it in the top left, those are the power nine compute nodes. Uh, with uh, with a bunch of GPUs and and also uh, network interfaces, uh, InfiniBand, um, which is RDMA capable of uh, 228 gigabits interface coming out of each uh, each card. Uh, so so just so that particular uh, compute nodes. So there are 5,000. One of them in each, uh, I think one 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 uh, uh, Lawrence Livermore has some numbers. I don't remember which one has. One of them has 5,000. Another one might have a little less or a little more. I don't remember. But uh, each compute node has uh, what we call internal code name is a bolt. That's a PCIe Gen 3 by 8, the capacity of a 1.6 terabyte. So so that is the very fast storage on uh, each compute node. So now the the bottom one, what we call a IO node, that's another different P P9 server, uh, which is attached to traditional large amount of traditional storage spinners, and uh, uh, this is the largest GPFS, the IBM GPFS file system of a 250 petabytes as a single biggest file system uh, in the marketplace. So that particular uh, uh, storage needs something like a very, very fast uh, log tip function. That's basically you want uh, put a very small amount of data, but you will be accessing uh, millions of times of that data uh, on a small data, like a four, four kilobytes or less of, of sizes. So that's another NVMe device. So this one is, uh, four gigabytes is the total capacity of the device. So uh, that the on a runtime, we are basically accessing the DRAM, but you are accessing through the NVMe interface. But when the power failure happens, the DRAM is backed by the flash. So it will flush out all the content of the DRAM and you power on the system. And then when you power the system, it will read it from a flash and restore it back into the DRAM. So it's basically the flash back to DRAM. Um, on the, and both these set of systems, the IO node and the compute node, connected via NVMe over fabric using a uh, infinity band as a medium. Um, and the ability of this lower IO nodes has the ability to do the read and the write to the target NVMe device. And the typical function of the NVMe device in the compute node, that's 1.6 terabyte, is uh, node is called a um, bus buffer. So the periodically, so you can imagine when you have these many systems, if you're given a, a job to the system to run, there is possibility of uh, some nodes failing for various reasons possible. So what they keep doing is they keep writing uh, their state on every every few seconds. I don't remember the interval how often they write, but they periodically write it. And then uh, if there's some job fails, they can restart the job from where the failed spot, but all that ha has to happen in a few minutes. So uh, that is why the high bandwidth uh, uh, storage is required. And also uh, this, this bus buffer, it will be drained in the sense it will be read by the IO node from the compute node and it will be stored on the traditional store uh, spinner medium for retrieval and uh, reuse. Uh, there are a couple of new features utilized on the compute node, what we call peer-to-peer. -peer. That means the network adapter, that's InfiniBand, has the ability to manage NVMe queues sitting on the bolt adapter without P9 CPU intervention. The reason why we, that is what we call a jitter. So if you use the CPU to manage some of the storage, your uh, 
compute job power is not guaranteed to run uh, without any uh, hiccups. So the, one of the goal is the storage kind of happens in the background without the CPU place. So that, that's a feature uh, uh, was in, introduced. And uh, this is up and running on the thing. Uh, this quarter, I think first quarter of yep. this year. Up and running one of the actually may be top spot in the top 500 computers in the world. So the fastest computer in the world. Yep. Um, took that over and uh, yeah, up and running. I've seen some pictures. That's a way cool. Yep. Rows yeah. and rows of racks. I <laughs> imagine 5,000 nodes. Um, rows and rows of racks. But very cool. Yeah. So one one thing I want to point out is if you can see that little table on the right side picture. There is a latency measurement, uh, local versus uh, with the fabric. Uh, the, with the fabric, uh, also what we call uh, without offload. That means CPU was utilized, and then another one is uh, with offload, with where the CPU is not utilized. So you can see it is well within the goal of the NVMe over fabric. Is a 10 additional microsecond overhead. I think uh, uh, we are. Well, within that, on the right, uh, we added uh, uh, three microseconds, so mm -hmm. local versus remote. So that's uh, we are proud of. We are proud of that performance there. So. All right. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, we have a few more. I thought we were done. Okay. Yeah, so, more. so now uh, these are the some of the very useful Linux uh, NVMe commands. I think I have one more chart uh, for the yeah, yeah. Uh, I had mentioned about. One thing I liked about the NVMe was the smart log, where you can uh, kind of get all the uh, vital information about the device in the one screen. So, um, so that's a, that's a called an NVMe smart log, and then the NVMe list will list you all the devices uh, in your system. You can have any number of devices. In this particular example, we just have one device there, and uh, there is a identify controller and then identify namespace. So it will display the properties of the controller and properties of the namespace. And then uh, on the former log will display uh, how many former slots. So there's a, uh, you can have multiple former loaded. Uh, typically we use it as a backup in case one former gets corrupted, it automatically go back to the another slot and then we'll start uh, using that and up and running. There's a standard, uh, you can have a format and then download and then those kind of a thing. And also Linux, uh, most who are using Linux probably would have familiar with the SAS report as a collecting all the all the different various functions of the system, on the Linux version, operating system, and all the devices. The NVMe debug information is included in that. Uh, so so this is the screen. What I'm showing is the output of the smart log. So a few things uh, I want to highlight there is that. Uh, Temperature. So, what is the uh, current temperature of the device? Okay, so that's showing, and then available spare. So, it's a pretty brand new device. So, how how much spare is available? It's, it's like fuel, right? Fuel gauge. It's 100%. So, your your fuel is full. And how much you're used from a overall life of the device? So, in this particular example, it's like 2% used, and also it tells you a lifetime of how much data you you read from the device, how much you've written. And then it does give you how long you powered on the device and how many times you are done unsafe shutdown. So they, sometimes folks don't follow the proper shutdown procedure. This device would record, hey, how many times you did uh, unsafe shutdown. And also it's a one byte on the top, what is called a critical warning. That one particular byte tells you very important information about the device. Are you running? Uh, low on the spare, or are you running uh, thermal warnings? Are there any real land or media problems? Or is there any backup security problem? So those kind of a things just puts it on one screen, and uh, uh, you can just monitor this to know the health of the device. And it will kind of tell you, it will warn you if it is, uh, if you are on a low spare, I think it tells you that. It will send you the event, and it will get logged in the kernel, and then that's probably think about next month or two think about uh, looking for device replacement kind of a thing. that's probably toward the end of the life not not toward the beginning and then so this screen is showing uh, similar information about what i shown in the linux so it's a aix 
the interface is slightly different, uh, but the in, uh, the information is same. So coming out of the device and the, and the AIX operating system uh, displays it in a slightly different, right? So you can see that uh, smart log in the bottom of the screen, same information as the previous one, but uh, it is displaying in a different format. So uh, I think previously when I mentioned it, so the investment for the development is like a one time. So yeah, of course, Linux is the one time and AIX have to develop it, but you could use on a multiple devices on a multiple systems, the same, same, uh, same interface. So the next one is just a topic introduction is called a multiple namespaces. So the way the NVMe works is it has got a controller. Uh, within the controller, uh, you can have uh, multiple namespaces. So for example, you have 1.6 terabyte device, you can create like a partition, logical partition, but, but it is like a separate, uh, uh, separate it will show up a separate device by itself. Uh, you can assign it to different, uh, if you want different LPARs, or you can assign it to all of them to same LPAR, or you can, mirror between them or you can divide it up whichever way you want to give it to your users or applications. Uh, there are certain limits. I think uh, we typically support, if, if the multiple namespace is supported, we support uh, 16 or more. So you can, any device you take, you can divide it up to 16 or more smaller chunks and you can install uh, operating system in one and you can have as a data data storage for another one or or whatever thing your favorite uh, storage you support. And then the last one there I'm covering there is the live firmware update. So while the system is up and running and the device is up and running, you can update the firmware and uh, the new uploaded firmware will take effect immediately. So that's uh, another feature. Uh, well, it, it is called a live firmware update. Uh, in the SaaS world, I think it's been there for, for all along. So it's not something new to the NVMe or a, or a storage world. Uh, the NVMe, they call live firmware update. So, so in the, uh, one of the questions, the high end um, ones, uh, Riley, are they uh, just like the, the scale out, are they independently assignable, all four of those drives? Yes, okay. so all the, yeah, all the four drives are independent, yes, you can assign it and you can mirror it same way. Okay, and the firmware you're talking here then, it's, like concurrently, you can load down the firmware and right. everything like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. so you don't have to shut down the system or reset the device or anything. Okay. So, but I think for enterprise class, we, we want the concurrent. Uh, oh, yeah. Live update, right? so, yep. Okay. So. Uh, I think that's the last chart. Yeah, I think that was the last chart. Uh, let me see what we have for questions here. Uh, let's go back. I want to go back a few charts and there was a question back here. <laughs> yeah, oh, what does when you say the TP here, what what's the Oh so, so TP stands for technical proposal? Oh okay. So the way it works is it um anybody can come up with any member, non member can propose new features. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the work group will uh, talk through the, your proposal, and then uh, it goes through the. They'll discuss it and then see whether the proposal is fine. Then, if it is feasible, and then it goes through and then becomes a formal in the spec once it goes through all the. Okay. Um, there was a question about. Uh, let's see. Uh, does the NVMe support external storage and cluster? Yes, so um, as you can imagine, so NVMe is, is a PCIe attached. So uh, there are uh, what we call NVMe enclosures. So uh, you can have PCIe uh, HPAs are basically PCIe switch cards, plug it into the system, and then you have a, a it's like a 1U or 2U standard storage uh, drawer. It looks like a standard storage drawer. And then the way it, you hook it up is through the PCIe switch. Once you hook it up, it looks like uh, 
extension of your system. You are ex extending your PCIe from your compute or CAC, what we call, to the external uh, direct attached PCIe drawing. So there are, uh, IBM does not offer any yet, um, but as you can imagine, yeah, there, are, there are a lot of things uh, going on within IBM labs. Uh, not only PCIe direct attached, also uh, fabric attached drawers. So the one example what we give Coral is what we call compute to compute, right? One computer to another computer accessing uh, uh, NVMe, but uh, there's just just like a SAN solution. The storage drawers are available in the market. We are evaluating and we are seeing what are the different use cases. And uh, uh, I would imagine it will show up in our IBM offerings uh, uh, in the next year or two as a PCIe direct attached and also uh, along the line, little later, uh, fabric attached. Uh, but um, without giving it too much way, I'm going to show you this one. All right. One right here. I don't know if you can talk to that, Morale. Uh, so, regarding NVMe, what is IBM doing to address NVMe on a one and two use form factor? For, for Hadoop. Uh, for example, 20 plus NVMe devices. For so, do we, what do we have available uh, on our LC device? Yeah, maybe? so so if you look at our uh, power LC line, um, I don't know. I think nine thousand nine. I don't. I mm -hmm. Don't quote me on so what we call as a Boston server. Yeah, yeah, you guys so, saw that. Yeah, so that one uh, supports uh, four U dot twos uh, from a from a front. We are exploring to offer to extend uh, uh, larger larger number, uh, but we are not got yeah. announcing. So it, it is possible, like you know, one U up to ten uh, U dot twos under two U to a large. 24 uh, physically that's those are the possibilities of we don't support any admin cards in those systems. we do we do so, yeah okay. so if you take if you take, if take well. that yeah if you take this bolt adapter of a uh, 1.6 3.6.4 terabytes yeah today we, we offer that and then uh, you can install add-in card and have the nvme okay uh let's see so when will nvme for power support data vg of AIX for heavy right I.O. So really, when are we going to have a, a, and, you know, we can't talk about unannounced product, products here. So what, the, but I think the question is, when are we going to have a, a drive, an NVMe um, that has a larger data right per day uh, for our systems? And uh, right now. Um, no. So the, the devices from NVMe technology is available. Mm -hmm. It is when IBM is going to offer. Right. So I, I, I do not believe we can comment on, on the date. Uh, is there a way to format these drives? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the NVMe, yeah, so similar to any other drives called a NVMe, command is format. So give a NVMe format and you can specify. Uh, it, it does support multiple different formats. For example, 512 bytes or a 512 byte with the T10 of a, a protection information, 4K at 4096 or 4096 with uh, T10. Not all the devices would support uh, T10. But whichever the devices support, you could uh, user could format it uh, whichever way they want. Okay. So this one, I gotta, I gotta read that one. Um, what is available today? Oh, that's where I'm going to Yeah. In our so today you can you can install. So the, so the question I'm reading here is what's available today OS for install on NVMe. So so AIX and Linux both support NVMe natively, right? So IBMI you could install it if you go through the VIOS. So VIOS would have it and then offer it up to the IBMI partition. But IBMI does not support NVMe natively. Not um, natively today. Today, right? <laughs> and and actually I. Um, we asked that question earlier, and there's there's some issues I think with IBMI. Um, I think supporting NVMe natively. I, I, I'm not sure where that's at, but not, I would yeah. So the IBMI team is very actively looking at it. No, oh, they are okay. So it is a question of time when we announce or offer. All right. But but yeah. So so um, 
AIX and, and Linux do, so you can certainly um, use those for boot. Um, other, other things besides NVIOS, of course, right? So other things besides boot drives uh, are, you know, we've kind of put this out looking for different ideas and uh, I've only heard a couple um, when I was talking to somebody the other day, you know, like a NIM server, as I mentioned, or if you were, had a cloud environment, that kind of thing. But um, other, other examples of why you'd want to use it, you know, I guess it depends on your environment and, and your use cases. But uh, as of right now, anyway, that's, that's all I've got for you. Um, NVMe does not support, as I mentioned, so I'm just looking through the questions here right now, does not support as a load source disk for IBM I. Um, does, do NVMe devices support storage reclamation, like SCSI um, unmap? Well, yes, yeah. So, uh, in the SAS and SCSI, <coughs> excuse me. So, so, so basically, unmap is you know, letting the device I know that yeah, I'm no longer using or going to use that LBA. So in the NVMe world, yeah, it does support oh, the feature called as a discard. So you are you are basically requesting device to dis discard particular LBA range. Yes, it does. It's supported. Uh, let's see, I had the question of can you put this into an 880 CAC? Uh, no, you cannot put these devices into an 880 CAC. The, not the uh, not the same ones that go into the the CACs of the uh, of the new Power 9 systems, modular systems anyway. Do you repeat me, what is it, which is 880? The Power 8 uh, scale-up scale okay. system. So they have Power 8 enterprise systems. They don't have any, they don't have any um, slots to install this. Now, they have PCIe, so um, they would accept an add-in card, PCIe yeah, yeah. card, mm -hmm. that, that's an NVMe card, but not the uh, M. Uh, not, not, not the M.2 form factor. Only a power nine. So, you know, there's, there's talk about the minimum number of code levels. Uh, Stephen, I don't have that at my fingertips now. I, I think we did have that um, in the, uh, when we did the power nine scale out um, discussion. Uh, I think maybe I had that there, but I, I'd have to dig that up and look up the charts for that. So I'm um, sorry about that. Uh, there was a, there was a question on here about. Uh, let me just go to this chart here, Raleigh. Uh, so it was were writes faster than reads, and let's look at. This chart here. So this is our read latency of 90 mm -hmm. microseconds mm -hmm. and a write latency of 35 microseconds. So, so the writes are faster than the reads in yep. this particular case. Right, so so, so the re okay, the reason why writes are faster typically... Are the uh, latency. Uh, yeah, uh, it is not really accessing the media. You have what is called a write cache into the device. So you're basically writing into the DRAM and they manage when to, uh, when to flush it up. And so this is the Spark device. Yeah. So this this is the PCIe, the add-in card Correct. system. So this is not the Poseidon, the the device that goes into the cat. Right. And and among the NVMe, you can see this is the kind of a slowest device. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, typically you will get 20 to 25 wow. microseconds on a write on a, on a good device. Uh, this is the this is the entry level uh, NVMe device. And, uh, yeah, so this is, the, this, is the, this is the kind of slowest device on the NVMe family. Okay. Um, all right. So I think really that we kind of finished out with, with the questions that we're able to answer here. Um, going to wrap up. Uh, Marley, thank you very much. This has been just a kind of a great learning experience to not just what products we have, what, you know, what they are, but how they work, how they drive, where the, where NVMe came from, the whole thing. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. And thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we're looking at um, August as the next webinar, end of August, and I'm hoping to cover all the Power 9 scale up our enterprise servers in detail. So a little bit of a couple of uh, tidbits here today, but hope to cover the, the whole things in detail um, that we should announce by the end of August and uh, cover them then. So with that, I hope you have a great month, and uh, that's it for today. So long. Thank you.